I think we have more than 30 participants, so maybe I'll, I'll start with introducing uh, you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our second uh, DEI research seminar of this semester. Uh, today, we're really honored and excited to have Dr. Um, to be Dr. PhD candidate, <laughs> uh, Holly Hartman. And she will talk about a very interesting and hot topic um, in a lot of areas centering around fairness in algorithms. Um, so without further ado, um, so oh, oh, before that, let me mention one last thing. Um, I put a link in the chat function, uh, which is a sign up sheet for the seminar. This will be helpful for our future grant application. So if you could please uh, sign up, uh, using the link. I will put that again uh, during uh, the middle of the talk while people are still coming in. They won't be able to see the previous chats. Now, uh, without further ado, let's welcome Holly. All right. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm really excited to give this talk today about al algorithmic bias. Um, this talk will be a little bit different from the other research seminars in that I'm actually going to be presenting research that I've done. This is going to be more of an overview of um, algorithmic bias, what it is, um, work that's being done um, in this area as well. So this is going to be more of a um, overview of the topic. So I'm hoping that we will be able to have some good discussions on this as well. So if you feel like you have things to contribute at any point, please feel free to, um, I have the chat open so you can put it in the chat or you can um, unmute yourself and we can talk. So I'd really like for this to be a bit more interactive. <clears throat> okay, let's get started. Um, so first let's talk about what exactly algorithmic bias is. Um, so in our world, um, algorithms are becoming increasingly more common it, and it goes by different names, AI, machine learning, deep learning. These are all basically algorithms and they're being increasingly used to make decisions in basically all fields of um, our lives. I'm going to be talking specifically about three, um, one that's looking at um, recidivism, one that's looking at employability, and um, this one which has become a hot topic recently is the Atlas um, program used by Tulane. So there's a lot of different areas where algorithms show up in our lives. So airline ticket prices, um, they look at demand, they look at supply, they gauge the prices based on um, things like that, credit scores, um, targeted advertising. I mean, I think we've all had the experience where you were just talking about something and then all of a sudden that ad showed up. Um, Theory suggestions, Siri is one large algorithm. Autocorrect from if you're texting on your phone, what words it suggests, that's a form of an algorithm. Um, college admissions, uh, US News college rankings, that is an algorithm behind the scenes that's taking information about all of these programs and outputting a ranked list. Um, suggested articles, Google has recent, Google Scholar has recently changed their algorithm for um, suggesting articles, and the rumor is that it has improved the suggestions. Um, facial recognition software, um, military warfare, determining um, military tactics and strategies, that's partially controlled by algorithms. Um, loan approval rates, internet searches, what, are, what Google will automatically suggest to you based on um, what you've already started typing, these are all algorithms. And these can have either very small effects on our life or very big effects on our lives. And um, the effects are likely related to other characteristics about us, which they shouldn't be. For example, um, autocorrect um, will probably not be very good at catching some of the, some language um, uh, characteristics that are not commonly used. So in the South, people say y'all a lot, but um, autocorrect very rarely will autocorrect something to y'all. <clears throat> and that can be an impact on things like our culture that we have, that we see. Okay, so what exactly is algorithmic bias? So this would is defined as systemic and repeatable errors in a computer system that create unfair outcomes, such as privilege in one arbitrary group of users over others. Um, and then here are two quotes about what exactly the impacts of this can be and how they come to be. So algorithms run the risk of replicating and even amplifying human biases, particularly those affecting pr protected groups. 
And then systems can be biased based on who builds them, how they're developed, and ultimately how they're used. So algorithmic bias can show up in a lot of different ways, and it can have small effects or it can have really big disastrous effects um, just based on the scale of the algorithm. So there's a book that is called Weapons of Math Destruction that um, has come up a couple of times in different presentations I've give, given. Um, and they define a weapon of math destruction as follows. So um, weapons of math destruction, they are um, opaque. They are not transparent. They um, are usually guarded by trade secrets or something along those lines. So you can't really learn about how they do what they're doing. Scale. According to her, weapons of mass destruction um, are large scale. So if they're going to be broadly implemented, then that would be a weapon of mass destruction. Um, and then danger. They have a negative effect on people. Um, they might encode racism or biases um, or even enable predatory practices by companies. <clears throat> so now I'm going to talk about um, some examples of algorithmic bias in a couple of different algorithms. Um, if you have questions about any of these, please feel free, or additional comments, um, please feel free. I think that probably some of you know about these, so if you have added things to say, I'd love to hear it. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is this one called Compass. Um, this one has, be, has been examined pretty thoroughly. Um, it's a tool that's used to predict recidivism, which is committing a crime after you've already been convicted of a crime. So the actual algorithms for this one are trade secrets. So they cannot be directly examined by the public or anyone who this algorithm affects. Um, and then they found that black, black defendants were far more likely than white defendants to be incorrectly judged to be at a higher risk of recidivism. And white defendants were more likely than black defendants to be incorrectly flagged as low risk. So this ha clearly has a <clears throat> different impact based on your race. Um, so you can see that that has some major impacts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so overall, the accuracy of the prediction for this tool is 61%, but the errors differ by race, like I just sh just showed. Um, so of people of white people who did reoffend, 47% um, were labeled as low risk, while that percentage among black people is 28.0%. And um, this was done by ProPublica. This was a study that they did on this, um, on this tool to look at what exactly is going on with it. Um, and this tool is actually still used today. I had just looked that up earlier today because I thought that with all of this research, this tool would have been discontinued in use, but it's actually um, still being used by some jurisdictions. So this is not just a case example of something that could go wrong or did go wrong and then we fixed it. This is still happening. <clears throat> so this tool has a couple of major flaws. So one is that it's opaque. There's no transparency in how this um, algorithm works. The data that's used is that of um, convicted people and that data has been often taken without their consent, and they don't know that that data will be used. So it's um, opaque and not transparent on several levels. Um, it's statistically weak. It uses proxy data to predict outcomes, and this includes things such as income levels. So this um, tool is actually not measuring um, criminal behavior very well even. Um, and then the data fits the model. So instead of updating continually to refine this model, it has no feedback um, system. So despite the um, errors that it's creating, it's not receiving that new information. This is a static tool. And so it's not updating. So it's continually perpetuating these results. Um, so this is a level of, um, harm that can come from an algorithm that is um, not uh, not well calibrated, uh, not transparent, not open source, anything like that. So um, this is that's the compass tool. Um, there's another uh, tool that's called Kronos, or that's a company called Kronos that um, makes tools that are part of pre-employment screening. So 
they have this one that's a personality type test. Most um, jobs actually do use some form of this personality test. It can be things like, um, <clears throat> you know, I think that being unique is better than being um, being boring or something along those lines. And you rank how well you agree with these things or it asks you to choose between um, two things that describe yourself. Um, and so this uh, employment test is broadly used. So it has the large scale effect. Um, it is also protected by trade secrets. So this algorithm is not open to the public to look at. And it advertises, we can help you screen, hire, and onboard candidates most likely to be productive. The best fit employees who will perform better and stay on the job longer. Um, and again, this, this algorithm has no feedback loop. So there's no way for this tool to know, okay, we said that this person wasn't gonna be a good fit for this job, were we right? Because there's no information that's going from the employer to Kronos. And there's also no information about um, someone that was rejected on the basis of this personality test, how they did in other jobs. So there's currently a lawsuit um, against Kronos. I could not find um, information about if this lawsuit is still active or what the result was, um, but they claim that this um, tool is in violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, as it tends to flag people with mental health issues as um, not being good fits or not being um, good employees. And so this um, piece has been heavily criticized. So this is one tool that can prevent people from getting jobs, getting experience, um, being open to opportunities, making money. So this tool can have a big effect on people's livelihoods. And the fact that it's so widespread, if you are flagged by this software at one company, you're more than likely gonna be flagged at other places as well because it's the same tool. Um, there are different variations of this tool, but they all come down to basically the same thing. Additionally, a major problem with this is that there's actually um, very little evidence of these personality tests being good predictors of um, how well an employee is going to perform. So these are all, um, I am talking about that case. So there's a message in the chat. If you're talking about Kyle Bem versus Kroger, that case is still ongoing. Okay, so that case is still ongoing right now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, and this tool is still used. There are, if you go and apply for jobs, they are still, um, oh, I'm sorry, apparently, um, oh gosh, that's upsetting. Okay, anyway, um, so the um, this tool is still being used, unfortunately. <clears throat> so the last example is one that has recently come up in um, Twitter that I've seen a lot and it's called Atlas. And this is an internal tool that's been used by Tulane. Um, so this one is not widespread, but a lot of programs use similar um, methods. So um, this is a program that's used to rank residency applicants. So the process for clinicians for how they do residency. So um, when they're medical students, they apply for residencies in their final year. Um, then the programs will invite a subset of those people who have applied to interview. Then the residents rank the programs at which they interviewed and the programs rank the residents that they interviewed. And then there's a, um, another algorithm that run, is run to match residents to programs based on these ranked lists. So this Atlas tool is, uh, was an algorithm that's designed to help the program rank the residents. Um, so this is not the actual match, interview, uh, match algorithm. This is the ranking from the institution of the residents. Um, and this was an internal tool that was developed by Tulane to rank these residents. And there is a lawsuit happening right now about this one as well, um, where this tool was structured to rank historically black colleges, accredited, accredited medical colleges, lower, such that um, even if a student had excellent test scores, it couldn't overcome, they couldn't overcome this barrier of the institution at which they attended being ranked lower. And so there's a lawsuit currently happening um, where this is one of the um, points being argued. And um, so this, this, although it is limited to Tulane, 
um, has had major impacts on the field. There are people that are looking at how residencies rank their um, applicants now um, because of this. <clears throat> so I want to take a minute and see if anyone has other examples that they know of um, or have seen examples of this um, elsewhere. I know that last week the DEI Biosats Journal Club did a talk about um, machine learning and racism. So if anybody was at that, I'd be happy to hear. I'd love to hear more about what was discussed there. I know that they discussed, um, I believe, the Optum healthcare algorithm there, which was um, prioritizing patients for care. Um, one of the variables that they included in their model was the cost of the care that the patient received. And there has been historical biases, human biases, that have resulted in Black patients ha um, receiving less care and spending less um, money on their health care. And so this tool used um, amount of money spent on health care as a proxy for the severity of um, of the care that they needed. And so it had um, major impacts where it was prioritizing um, black patients lower than similarly sick white patients. And that has been, that tool was used across the country um, and they're working currently to um, correct some of these biases. And I believe they claim they have been successful in addressing these biases of the algorithm. Um, but that was a recent one that had been published on I believe in science. <clears throat> okay. We have a few uh, comments in the chat function where people are oh, reading, wonderful uh, examples. <clears throat> Uh, even before the big data er era, there were discussions about educational testing biases. Yeah. Um, so standardized tests have been shown to have different results based on your gender and based on your race. And that is true across the test. Whatever test you're taking, um, women perform worse than men and um, uh, people who are white and Asian tend to perform best. So there's a lot of biases in that. And then if those test scores are then used to make admissions decisions, you can see how that um, just starts to grow into a big problematic matter. Um, there's an issue with facial recognition technology, uh, misclassifying people of color and women. Yeah, so um, I know that police forces have started using facial recognition technology to um, make arrests and um, prosecute people, but they've shown that it is um, not as accurate with people of color. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you people for um, speaking up. Does anyone wanna talk about any of those examples a little bit more? This is Kathy. The only thing that I can say is that some of these things have been well, well publicized and well known, and yet we still use them. So it's, yeah. it's um, so I think that one of the things that I'm curious about is that if you've got thoughts about, so what, what can we do? What should, what should we do? Yeah. yeah and, uh, and, I'm going to yeah, talk yeah, about that. Easy, a bit. Easy decision. Yeah, that's easy. I know an easy question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk more about that at the end of what can be done. Um, the problem that I see with, with a lot of these methods and these algorithms is that it's really on the onus of um, whoever's producing the algorithm to correct it. And um, you can see there's clearly very little incentive to do that. If people are willing to pay for their product as is, why would they bother fixing it? Um, so. Um, I think that part of the problem is really going to be um, how to get these companies to, um, to address these issues, because it's quite simple to fix an algorithm. If you know it's biased, you can just go in and add additional constraints to that algorithm. Um, 
you can hard code some of these um, some of these rules that I'm going to discuss fairness criteria into your algorithm. Um, and so like it's not necessarily a huge difficult like impossible task to fix a biased algorithm. It's a lot more difficult to fix a biased human than a biased algorithm, let's say. Um, and yet there's no incentive for these companies to do that. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about that a little bit more along with some fairness criteria as well. But there's also the, uh, there are some um, finance sectors using for loan applications that have come mm. uh, and into criticism too. And, um, and there are a lot of, lot of banking industry uses these kinds of tools, machine learning tools and algorithms to identify whether we should be giving them um, Oh, they should allow them to open accounts in their bank industry or give loans and so on. So that's a big sector that is using these two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, can I just and, say one other thing? Can I just say one yeah. other thing too? Is that I, I hear you're talking about companies, um, and that kind of like puts the focus outward as opposed to are there are there algorithms that are being developed by academics by us that face the same thing. So I, I think it's kind of important to not make, you know, not make it always outward facing, but bad companies who are making money. But I think that there's a lot, a lot of things that are, are academic uh, or not for profit that, you know, bias is, is human. So. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I also think that if you expand the definition of an algorithm to define like any kind of process where you're classifying people, I mean, you can look at admissions, um, admissions to a program as an algorithm, even though it's humans who are talking with each other, they're inputting the data of the applications and outputting either this person is accepted or not accepted to this program. And um, so there are lots of places where algorithms, I mean, come into it, into academia. And then as statisticians, we have lots of, um, we have lots of uh, tools that we develop and models that we create that are looking at predicting risk, predicting um, probabilities of things, of occurrences, um, looking at averages to try to in make informed decisions. So a lot of what we could do could be broadly classified as creating algorithms. So you're absolutely right with that. <clears throat> yeah, the Apple credit card. I just saw that today and I haven't really dug into what exactly happened with the Apple credit card. Um, but I've seen that popping up recently. And then there's another chat um, about a grading algorithm, downgrading the results of those who attended state schools and upgrading the results of pupils at privately funded independent school, thus disadvantaging pupils of a lower socioeconomic background, in part due to the algorithm's behavior around a small cohort size. My understanding yeah. was that in COVID, they couldn't give tests, so they just generated grades. <laughs> yeah, there was, oh yeah, this is the UK one. Yeah, yeah. So they, they just, <laughs> it, I can't, I really cannot believe that this happened. They just like gave everybody grades based on where they went to school almost. <laughs> and those um, grades are, um, how it's determined like what schools you're eligible to go to. Because I believe that this was in high school, they were, it was a score for admissions to, um, to universities and colleges. Yeah, um, A-levels in, in UK are like the end of your, like your senior year and the grade that you get allows you to go into certain, like admitted to certain universities. So because COVID wasn't, because COVID didn't allow for testing, they used a mix of, students prior year uh, test results or like grade uh, averages, as well as uh, the school's overall or average uh, performance across all, sc all schools. So it just gave a score to the students without letting them take a test, uh, which is obviously a biased one. And the Apple car credit card is, has been found uh, to bias against females even if they had the exact same, uh, you know, savings, exact, 
you know, belong, belongings, whatever. Uh, and this was brought up by Steve Wozniak, co-founder of Apple. So him and her, his wife applied for the credit cards. Uh, he got 10 times more credit line than the wife had uh, was offered despite them having every single one of their assets mutually uh, like joint assets um, wow wow <laughs> that's wild yeah and i know for um things like credit scores and loan applications they aren't actually allowed to um take information about some of these protected classes, but they have so many um, proxies for them that they, you almost still, regardless of if you have that variable in your data, um, still some of these biases show up. Although it sounds like that's probably not the case for the Apple credit card if everything else was identical, it's just the gender all their of the assets, all, all the assets were joint and to your yeah. point, these are regulated industries, so they couldn't have used protected classes. So yeah. there was probably somewhere in there standing as a proxy for for gender. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, okay. So thank you very much for participating. Um, I'm going to move on with the lecture. I'm very I'm very excited for continuing these discussions, though. Um, so let's talk about a little bit of what causes these algorithmic biases. Um, so the first one is historical human biases. This is um, the equivalent of having bias data. So there, people have unconscious or even conscious biases, um, and those can be replicated by machine learning algorithms. So the machine can learn human biases and output that as well. Um, so an example, this was um, what I discussed earlier. So less money is spent on healthcare for black patients, which is um, historical human bias that has happened. Um, thus, when cost is used as a proxy for amount of care needed, the algorithm determines that black patients need less health care than white patients. So if you're just thinking broadly, like, oh, yeah, the amount of money I spend on something is clearly um, related to how severe that need is. But because there are historical biases are ingrained in the data, um, you uh, end up having a biased algorithm. So another example is if there's incomplete or rep unrepresentative training data. So if there's insufficient information about some underrepresented group, then those estimates and those predictions will have wide variance um, and can e very easily be inaccurate. So an example of this is that electronic health record data has historically come from wealthy and predominantly white hospitals. And we're using ele um, electronic health record data to um, do a lot of cool statistics and looking at prediction of risks and stuff like that. But those algorithms have less information about the care for black patients. So um, as we go through this process of um, exploring this new exciting type of big data, electronic health records, we have to be really mindful that our samples in this case might not be representative and we have to look at um, strategies to mitigate that effect. <clears throat> Another um, issue would be if there's modeling issues. So um, a lot of times machine learning algorithms and a lot of our other statistical methods are not equipped to handle um, extreme data. We're more equipped to handle you know, the bell curve, the main um, portion of people. But as algorithms become more commonly used, there will be, be people who are in the extremes that um, our algorithm is being applied to. So models that aren't trained well for extreme values or outliers won't perform well for a subset of people. And when that algorithm is broadly ap applied, then this can have major impacts for people. So an example I was thinking of for this would be if you're looking at the time it takes to perform an action. Um, I was thinking in my head of crossing the street and you're trying to program future um, intersections on how long the length of the time is for the little walkie guy, um, if a person has a disability, then that algorithm might not be well calibrated for that type of person. So if you're just going and get collecting data, you might not have a person who um, takes a very long time to cross a crosswalk in your data set. And therefore, um, as you go through this process of 
building other intersections, your intersections aren't going to be well designed for a subset of people, a subset of people that will eventually be using this infrastructure. Um, or if your modeling method just doesn't include this person or um, otherwise negates information about disabled people because they take up such a small portion of your data. So there are a lot of ways that algorithms can um, have bias, but none of these causes are things that cannot be overcome with um, alterations to the um, algorithm. Okay. Um, so does anyone want to discuss any of those causes or talk about other causes of potential um, bias in algorithms? Okay, so I'm going to go on um, and next I'm going to be talking about fairness criteria. So fairness criteria are um, <clears throat> typically framed as statistical statements, mathematical statements of how a algorithm should perform. So here's a little bit of notation. So um, R is going to be our classifier, our score. It's going to be our algorithm outcome. And so an example of this would be a loan approval, um, a treatment given, a college, a college admission decision. So this is the end result of the algorithm is R. A is gonna be the sensitive attribute. Um, this terminology is from um, machine learning, um, a machine learning bias text that I found. So A is the sensitive attribute. So this could be things like race, gender, disability status, um, anything that you wouldn't actually want to have an effect on your actual outcome, um, but might. Uh, and then why is the target variable? So this is what we're trying to predict. So for example, for the loan approval example, we are trying to predict if this person is going to default on their loan. And so we would not want to approve them if they were going to default. Uh, whoops. Another example would be survival. We're trying to predict what treatment is best for these patients. So survival is our main outcome. And then for college admission, what you're trying to really predict by admitting students and not admitting students is if they're going to graduate. Is this student going to be successful in this program? So when Y and R are binary, then we can define um, several terms with that. So we can have the true positive rate or sensitivity. And this is when the um, truth is that uh, one, this is a success and our algorithm pre also predicts a success. Um, we can also look at um, positive predictive value, which is the probability that um, the it is a true success conditional that our algorithm predicted success. Then there's the false negative rate, the probability of our algorithm predicting a failure when the true outcome was success. False positive rate is just the opposite probability of our algorithm saying that this would be successful um, at, it, conditional on it being not a success. And then there's the true negative rate, also known as specificity. This is the probability of when the, it is a true failure in terms of algorithms, not like a human being. When the um, outcome is predicted, or when the true outcome is failure, that the algorithm also predicts failure. And then the negative predictive value, probability that when the algorithm says this is going to be a failure, that it is a true failure. So these are um, all, values that are going to be important in defining the next several um, criteria. So in general, there are three non-discrimination criteria. There's independence, separation, and sufficiency. So independence is that the um, outcome of the algorithm is independent of that sensitive attribute. So here's what that means. So the probability that the algorithm is going to predict success is the same for if a person is in um, group A or group B. So this could be for people who are white, for people who are black, for men or for women. You want this algorithm to be the same regardless of this sensitive attribute value. So this is saying that the um, uh, positive prediction rate is equal regardless of the sensitive attribute. Um, so here are some examples, except in, where independence holds. Um, acceptance to a program is equal between black people and white people. 
Um, so this has no information about the true outcome. This is only what the algorithm predicts. So if this is, if the algorithm is um, acceptance or rejection from a program, acceptance is equal between um, black people and white people, or loan approval rates are equal for men and women. <clears throat> Here would be an example of where independence does not hold. Fewer black patients with severe COVID-19 symptoms are ventilated than white patients with severe COVID-19 symptoms. So here we're looking at patients with severe COVID, sim severe COVID symptoms and the probability of being ventilated. Um, so we assume that black patients with these severe symptoms are in every other way equal to white patients with these severe symptoms, but the probability of them being ventilated is not the same. So this would be a case where independence does not hold. Your probability of being ventilated is based on your race. <clears throat> um, Jeremy asked, shouldn't this definition of independence also condition on other variables X? Um, would those other variables be other um, attributes of the, um, um, yeah, okay. So I think that this condition of um, independence of other variables would come into what the algorithm is gonna predict. So if you do have other, um, other attributes such as um, if we're looking at grades, yeah, job qualifications, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, yeah, I would agree that this should be conditional on X as well. Okay, um, so the next, the next um, definition is for separation. So this is um, the predicted outcome from the algorithm is independent of that sensitive attribute conditional on the true, um, true outcome. Oops. Um, so this is saying that the true positive rate is equal between all, all members of um, all sensible, sensitive attribute categories and the false positive rate is equal between members of all sensitive um, attribute categories. So the, um, um, the probability of outcome is independent of um, the sensitive attribute conditional on the true outcome. So some examples of how this could hold and not hold. So um, the proportion of, college, of students admitted to a college program is equal between men and women who truly, uh, is equal between men and women who truly would succeed in the program and the proportion of students admitted to this college program is equal between men and women who would not truly succeed in that program. So this one is a little bit difficult because you're conditioning on the true response and sometimes you don't know that, um, especially you wouldn't know that before the algorithm predicts it. And in a case like this, um, there are times when you don't know that. So you wouldn't know their true success in a program if they were rejected to that program and never got the opportunity. So there are times where you cannot examine this. <clears throat> the problem comes when some X are actually proxies for A. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so here's an example of when the separation does not hold. So the proportion of patients diagnosed with low oxygen levels via the pulse ox um, finger monitor um, is not equal between black patients with true, true low oxygen levels and white patients with true um, low oxygen levels. So this is an unequal true positive rate. So this is a true um, example where we have discovered that um, those uh, pulse ox finger monitors that they use to measure your um, blood oxygen levels are not as good at detecting low oxygen levels among people with darker skin colors. So this is a um, example where the probability that you're gonna be correctly diagnosed with low oxygen depends on race, which is not what we want. <clears throat> okay, sufficiency. So um, sufficiency is where the true outcome is independent of the sensitive attribute when you condition on the algorithm outcome. So this one is a little bit um, easier to examine because it's um, conditioning on the true algorithm output. So then this is saying that the negative and positive predictive values are equal among um, all, uh, regardless of membership in any group of the sensitive attributes. <clears throat> so this means that if the algorithm predicts your success, then the probability, 
predict success, then the probability of truly being success does not depend on other attributes such as race or gender um, or uh, disability status. Um, so here's an example of that. Um, I'll read that in the next bit. Um, so the probability of succeeding in a program is equal between men and women who were admitted. <clears throat> um, and the probability of succeeding in the program uh, is equal between men and women who were not admitted. So this would be, here's an example of when sufficiency does not hold. Women have a higher probability of graduating from the program who, from a program than men who are also admitted. So if sufficiency held, then we would expect equal graduation rates between um, men and women in a program. Um, because they were all admitted, the algorithm of admissions um, predicted success. We predicted that they were going to graduate. Um, and so if we have different um, outcomes of, in terms of graduation rates by the sensitive attribute of um, gender identity, then this would be an example where sufficiency does not hold. And this is, a, is something that we see in a lot of data. Women have higher graduation rates at all levels of education. Except, I'm not sure if that holds in in the highest levels, but for high school, college, uh, master's programs, this is what we see. <clears throat> okay. Um, Shu says, I agree with Raghu. Any approach that relies on associative measures of association will do an intuitively wrong thing in scenarios where the sensitive feature is not randomly assigned like gender, but instead exhibit spurious correlations with the outcome through, um, through other possibly unobserved features. Yes. So a lot of issues come up with, um, as as Jeremy said, it, conditioning on other variables X. So um, if historically men have been offered more jobs than women and more offered more times that they can get promoted, um, then if we look at jobs qualification as something that we want to condition on, then we would be further um, adding bias to our um, to our algorithm by incorporating this when systemically men have been um, have had more opportunities than women. So there is a balance between conditioning on other variables and accidentally conditioning on something that is your sensitivity uh, of your that is your sensitive group. Um, however, if you do look at your um, algorithm overall, you might you might not assuming that the people who are being considered for a job all have, you know, roughly um, equal experience between the two sensitive groups, then you wouldn't actually have to condition on things like X. <clears throat> oh yeah, I saw this one. Um, okay, so Amazon had an algorithm that they were looking at where they were looking at um, job applicants. And this is what the quote said. In effect, Amazon systems taught itself that male candidates were preferable. It penalized room resumes that included the word women's, as in women's chess club captain. And it downgraded graduates of two all women's college, according to people familiar with the matter. Um, so Amazon was looking at <laughs> resumes and they trained this algorithm on who um, they wanted to interview and who was successful at the company. And they found that it continued to um, increase the bias in their hiring system rather than making it more equitable just because they didn't, um, <laughs> they didn't do a good job of training their algorithm, essentially. Um, to, to Amazon's credit, I believe that system is no longer used. So unlike the other examples where <laughs> it's still being used despite knowing that there's these things there, <laughs> Uh, yeah, some women use initials instead of their first names to try to avoid this type of bias. Um, yeah, I, I say I will say that on my CV, I have my full name, of course, at the top, but on all subsequent subsequent pages, I've just put H. E. Hartman instead of putting Holly Hartman, since my name is very feminine. So um, even as myself, I have done I've noted that. <laughs> <clears throat> 
Um, okay, so there's also legal terminology that is used in um, this arena and that's called disparate impact. And so this is uh, where you look at the ratio of positive prediction rates by group. And so it, this is a term that refers to um, practices. This is common in employment and housing um, that adversely affect people of one group of a protected characteristics more than another, um, even though rules that are applied by employers or landlords are formally neutral. So this is kind of getting at what we were talking about, where if you're conditioning on other variables, you might continue to um, uh, continue to propagate uh, historical biases. So um, yeah, so if these rules are things like you have to pass the Kronos test, that is going to be uh, have a disparate impact on people who have mental health conditions. And so this is a legal term which has very specific meanings to some people. Um, and it differs from the other ones where lawyers are not going to be arguing about the sufficiency of a algorithm. They're going to be arguing about the disparate impact. So there are other terms that are used. Um, there's, um, or uh, not other terms, but there are other um, fairness criteria that are used as well. So there's demographic parity. Um, that's similar positive prediction rates between groups. There's equal opportunity. And this requires that the true positive rates are similar across groups. Um, equalized odds, this requires that the false positive rate and the true positive rates are similar across groups. And then um, what I enjoy is fairness through awareness. And so that requires that individuals with similar, um, individuals will have similar classification um, if they are also similar. So similar can be defined with respect to a specific task. So this would be things like, um, those covariates that we were conditioning on. So if you're looking at two applicants for a job and they're similar in most regards, then they should have similar outcomes. So there was a study that was done a while ago where they had identical applications. They just changed the name on it. And they found that um, people with um, people with names that are more common among black people were discriminated against. Um, they received higher call, or fewer callbacks for jobs, fewer interviews than people with um, traditionally white names. So this would be an that would be an example of where um, similar individuals did not have similar outcomes. And then there's a lot of other ways that you can define fairness statistically. So there's um, where the overall procedure accuracy is the same for um, each group category. So they're classified as success or failure at the same rates. Um, there's uh, statistical pariety, there's conditional procedure accuracy. So this is the false negative rate and false positive rates are the same. Um, then there's treatment equality and that's when the ratio of false negatives and false positives is the same for both groups. And then there's total fairness. And there's a lot of um, work that has been done to show that you, very frequently cannot satisfy all of the fairness criteria that you want to satisfy. Um, and that can be dependent on a lot of other things that you might want to condition on. And so here's a list that um, is put together. It's in this book that I have been referencing a couple of times about all the different definitions of fairness criteria, where they show up and um, what they are closely closest related to in terms of those three main definitions as well. So there's a lot of different ways that you can define fairness. And there's a lot of different ways that you can go about um, examining an algorithm to see if it's fair and to see how it, what it checks out. Um, so I'm going to next talk about methods for um, detecting and correcting for this. Um, and I'm just going to go uh, through this and then if we have time at the end we can continue to discuss more. Um, so the first one is one that I'm especially interested in. It's called agent-based methods. And so this this is a uh, method to describe phenomenon. So this would be a way to detect algorithmic bias. So this is where you create individual agents and they interact with each other and they interact with the world that you've simulated as well. So this is basically a simulation technique. Um, so 
these models are advantageous because they allow more heterogeneity than things like a um, ordinary differential equation model. They also allow for um, simulating social dynamics and policy experimentation. And you can really um, examine your algorithm to see how you can make tweaks to make it better. Um, additionally, because you are in total control of these simulated worlds, you can identify causal relationships. So you can look at the counterfactuals under these simulations um, since you're in the ultimate control here. So you can say with this algorithm, here's the outcome we see. But if we twist this one dial or <laughs> modify one variable or remove a variable, here's the um, output that we see. And it's due only to this change that we made because we know that everything else was kept constant. And there are a lot of tools that are available for implementing um, agent-based models. Um, here are three listed here. The most common one, I believe, is called NetLogo. And that's integrated into Python and R. Additionally, you can um, update your algorithmic process, your algorithmic development process, to incorporate those fa fairness criteria. So pre-processing, you can adjust the feature space to be uncorrelated with the sensitive attribute. Then at training time, you can work the constraint into the optimization process. Um, so you can uh, alter your algorithm to um, require certain fairness constraints. And then post-processing, you can adjust a learned classifier so that it's uncorrelated with the sensitive attribute. Um, one cool tool that I found is called AI Fairness 360. And this is a tool that IBM produced um, and it allows you to examine bias in your own machine learning models. It also has a really fun um, uh, web demo. You can go through an example and look at the results for it. And it talks about different ways that these examples are not fair and how you could correct for them. And um, this is a very interesting tool, especially if you're interested in doing more work with um, creating algorithms or looking at algorithmic fairness. <clears throat> there are also a lot of um, business concepts aimed at um, improving algorithmic fairness. So although we had said earlier that it's not all companies, we can't all point outwards, it's sometimes our academic um, selves as well creating these un unfair algorithms. Um, it's interesting that there are a lot, a lot of blog posts about how to make um, fair algorithms for business. So, this is a, these are the five C's for building data products. So there's consent, making sure that the people who are in your data set know they're in your data set. Um, there's clarity. So being cl clear and upfront about what your goals are with this. Consistency and trust. So um, this I think is one of the harder ones to manage because it requires consistently showing up. It's not just a one-time thing where you are like, yeah, we did good with this algorithm. And then you go back and you, um, produce more unfair algorithms. Control and transparency. So we talked a lot at the beginning about transparency and how a lot of these are very opaque black boxes. Um, and then being upfront about the consequences of your algorithms and thinking through all the potential consequences as well. Uh, and then there are, here are the other suggestions that I saw quite frequently repeated when I was um, doing research for this talk. Um, so increasing diversity in AI and machine learning fields. I think that that's a good goal for um, at all levels of improving diversity, just getting more viewpoints, more people asking questions, more people say, uh, to identify when things are not fair or when things are um, not, a, uh, not uh, or are acting as proxies for other sensitive variables. Um, there are also external firms that companies can hire to be data and model auditors. Um, and then these next two are about making your work transparent. So making the algorithms publicly accessible for scrutiny um, and then making the data sets available to the public. So I know that's especially, that's a little bit difficult for us where we're dealing a lot with um, confidential information, but as much as you can making data sets available to the public really helps um, ensure that um, ensure that these algorithms are being fair. And then additional legislation and regulation of these algorithms preventing um, preventing uh, 
widespread use of some of these weapons of math destruction, I think is important. There's also a lot of room for methodology development here. Um, there is a lot of room for building uh, tools that have built in fairness constraints. And then additionally, there's a lot of room for developing software to output fairness metrics for a given algorithm. So I know we have a lot of brilliant people on this call right now. So this is my call to action to you. These are areas where um, research is needed, where we are needed to develop these methods. Uh, so to conclude, um, algorithms, they are used in all parts of our lives, whether we know it or not. And so this need for fairness is only growing. Um, current methods require a lot of added effort on the algorithm builders um, side of things and have not been widely adopted due to that. So we need new methodology that is easy to implement to ensure algorithmic fairness. Um, and thank you very much. I have two, two minutes for extra discussion. <laughs> and I'm happy to stay a little bit after if anybody wants to talk about any particular issue as well. So I have a question, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. Re regarding the, you know, the slides, you have definition of independence and the separation and the sufficiency. Yeah. Is it the, the Venn diagram, shown in the ways uh, to mean that all three cannot coexist at the same time, or it's not meant to say that? Um, no, this was just design. Um, <laughs> but I did think about that. They, there, if you, this, um, where is it? I have the link for the book that I used. The Fairness ML book, here it is. This book had a um, further chapters explaining how um, these, uh, criteria are all related. So they were talking about like, if this one is satisfied, then this is what that means for these other criteria. So there's more information in this book. I'll put, I'll put the link in the uh, chat or I'll try to at least. Thank you very much. Yeah. And this book is, I, I, it's not finished, I think. So this is just like a PDF that they have available, but um, I found it very helpful when I was making this presentation, just in terms of thinking about algorithmic fairness as a statistical property. Shu says any two of the three criteria we saw are mutually exclusive except in degenerate cases. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think that and then when you are designing algorithms, you have to think about what what is your important in terms of how is this algorithm algorithm going to be fair. So um, <clears throat> you know you might not want sufficiency to necessarily hold if you're conditioning on um, predictors that are related to uh, to uh, the sensitive attributes. Yeah. Yeah, sample selection bias, measurement bias, and modeling bias. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Kathy says that uh, getting good unbiased data is crucial, but if the data aren't unbiased, then we're starting out in trouble. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the biggest issues in this field um, because it's using big data and big observational data. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of issues there. So um, I, I'm trying to think of how you could get unbiased data even for some of these tasks. And I just, I don't even think it's possible, especially because of um, the historic human biases that have just been so uh, <laughs> unimpeded and have grown to be so disastrous. Um, any data that we have has been influenced by these historic biases. And so a, a lot of times, I'm not sure how you'd get that. Um, yeah. 
But just like in your talk, the first step is recognition and awareness. And yeah, you would think even though it's been around for a long time, you just do your daily work and sometimes you don't think about it. Anyway, I've got a scoop, but really nice talk and really nice to think about these things. Thanks, Holly. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for participating. <laughs> Um, I see some people are still hanging around. You all are free to go. If anyone would like to stay and chat though, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you all for listening today. It was really, really great time.